episode 11 of Living Well. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been quite the crazy week. I got to announce my album. It's called Heart Theory. It is out August 14th. I'm so excited for you all to hear this music and I'm so happy I can finally talk about the album title. So that's been a huge step in the right direction. We also released a brand new song. It's called Want Me Back. We might get to that a little later. But, um, but yes, it's been a very exciting week in terms of music world for me. Um, tomorrow I'll be hosting CMA Summer Stay K with Jimmy Allen. So there's just a lot going on. Um, I am very excited about our guests for today. First off, we have a human being that I look up to. I have looked up to him for years. Ever since I moved to Nashville, I had his name up on a vision board wanting to work with him one day. Years later, fast forward, and he is now my producer. I learned so much from him. Um, he is one of the most humble, egoless, down-to-earth people you will meet. So um, let's bring him on the show, guys. American record producer and songwriter for his work as a producer in the country music genre. He has won several awards, including CMA Musician of the Year and ACM Producer of the Year. He has a list of accolades that very few people on this planet can even try to match. He has played on albums for Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Barbara Streisand, Kenny Rogers, Amy Grant. He was in the rock band Giant in the 80s. He produces everything from Kane Brown to Lady Annabellum to Brett Young to Russell Dickerson to yours truly. I am so excited to have on my producer, the one and only Mr. Dan Huff. Hey, Dan, how's it going? Going good, thanks. It's good to see you. Um, my goodness, we just announced the album yesterday that the two of us have been working hard on for about a year, really. Yeah. Seems like it's it seems longer than that. Just the way I mean, the way we make records, it it, it kind of got by the end because of this uh, lockdown. We we were able to kind of be on a, a, a quicker timeline because at the beginning, it's like you were always out touring, right? I mean, that's that's the way this whole business goes. Come in, cut for a little bit, and then you're back out. Uh, you know, make a living. I know. I remember for our first session. We'd have to schedule vocal sessions in between when I'm getting on the bus or off the bus or coming from the airport. And so, yeah, we actually finished our last band tracking session the day before Nashville shut down. Remember that. Which was crazy. Um, and it was just a blessing. We were able to, to fit that in. And then I've been telling everybody that we finished the album remotely from this room in my house to that room in your house. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Back and forth. Took a little bit to get on the same, get our kind of our dance steps, uh, you know, coordinated, but but we got it. It's the guitar part was the hard part, right? The guitar part was the hard part. And I say, Dan is now my coach. I can barely play guitar solo without him because I feel like I need Dan's opinion on what I'm doing, where, where I should go, what is not right with it. But, um, okay, so I want to ask, do you have a favorite song off of this album? You know, too 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 early. It sounds like a stock answer, but it's just the truth. Uh, no, I mean, I I I don't I I never kind of have that process even going in because kind of my what you hired me to do is is to try to kind of realize every one of these songs. These are special for you. Um, Absolutely. And and so that for me to do that requires number one. That's why I never got into into like you know, um, I try not to be an A and R person. I know it's such a hard job. Why not to be a publisher? I mean, it, it, my publishing, my forays into publishing have been only because it's 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 uh, been for other people that work with me and whatnot. But it's never been for my kind of mode of operation because t for me to 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 really make records, you have to be indiscriminate about the music you're making because because in a perfect world, you know, it, just in our example, you you have something to say, and and my job is to help you say it. Case closed, that's the end of it. Not based on if I have more incentive for this song, that song. 
even taking it to the point of your question, whether I like a song more than another one, um, that doesn't seem to be kind of really the job. Now, I will say this, after a, because it sounds like a big cop out now that I've said all that, but no, but that's think, so true. I think in I think I think maybe a year from now when I hear this music and I'm not, it's not so close in my rear view. I, certain things will probably jump out. I, I tend to, I mean, personally, because I came from the '70s R&B kind of, that was when I was a high school kid. Mm -hmm. I tend to gravitate towards those kind of songs. I just like that kind of feel. And that's kind of what I play when I just sit around outside and kind of enjoy just listening to music. Absolutely. I always tell people in interviews that working with you has been so incredible because a job as a producer is a difficult job to be able to sit down with an artist and like pull all of those things out of them that, that are inside of, of their hearts and their brains and they're wrestling with, and you just do it so eloquently and effortlessly. And it's just been, it's been, such an incredible process and, and treat truly to, to work with you. Do you have a favorite moment over, I mean, I know it's hard to even think back on the past year or, or just working on this album, working through, you know, the different sessions. We, we've gotten to work with some incredible session musicians that we've, you know, flown in even from out of town. Is there a, a particular moment that sticks out of your mind out of, you know, the past few years well it's specifically on this record right yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what i mean I, I i really enjoyed i mean obviously the first time that you and i worked together was on you were a guest on on brantley's like, song, right? yeah. and and um and, and of course we we had known each other before that and since you were the guest it was kind of a, a quick kind of a shotgun thing you know we got in the studio uh, i was really impressed with the way that you articulated what you wanted to be that was that was the first kind of that was the first catch kind of for me as far as going, Ooh, there's an artist in here. When you started playing guitar, same thing happened. So fast forward to when we started making this record, it was still kind of, I was more in, 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 in a listening mode on the first tracking dates. I don't know if you recall that, but I mean, you know, I'd, I'd say things, but it, but the, the drill was to figure out for me to figure out who you were putting you together with a band. We, 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 you know, cast a band that we we both thought was going to be good it was a really good choice to answer your question i think the next phase when you and i started overdubbing and you came over to my studio and you started playing guitar because it's funny because i'm a guitar player so i that that's a language that's near and dear to my heart so i feel like i got to know you more as a musician ironically just sitting three feet from you and, and watching you play guitar and just, you know, like, like what we would do, we'd just say, Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, do that. Or, you know, I would say do something that you do something totally different, which I would like better than my suggestion. But that was, that was kind of the bridge between us, you know, I mean, and, and it, it, it kind of emanated out to, to, to vocals, you know, I, you know, I think your, your singing on this record really has, I mean, you're, you're growing as a musician, as a singer. I mean, it's all the same thing with you. Well, I have long-winded answers, don't I? Wow. No, this is, are you kidding me? This is the perfect thing. You're the perfect guest. Yeah, I, I, I can't. They're so long, I forget where I started. But, but I think, I think that if I'm answering your question correctly, I think it was doing some guitar over it was the first time. That was it. I really enjoyed that. Well, you definitely helped me raise my own bar as a musician. And I always tell people that my first guitar session, I think it was cutting guitars on what happens in a small town. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I was going to play guitar in front of you. And I was so nervous. I was shaking in my car walking in because I was like, I have to play guitar in front of Dan Huff. I mean, he is my guitar idol and I have to go play guitar in front of him. And I walked out of that studio that day feeling so lifted up. You were so, I'm, I'm just going to brag on you right in front of you to make you uh, feel awkward. But you were just so humble and down to earth. I mean, you have a list of accolades that, not very many humans on this earth can compare to. And you just have a way of just working with people and lifting the, the, the people who are around you up in, in remarkable ways. So I just, I'm very grateful for you. Now, you've, you've come from a very musical family. I mean, your kids are so also talented, but I want to know, when did you and your brother become serious about starting a band? You know what? I, we were raised by a, um, a musical parents. My father was an orchestrator, composer, and all that kind of stuff. My mother's a classical pianist. 
so we were raised in that scenario and, and, and we were also, we moved down to Nashville when we were probably 10, 11. And my dad was one of the forerunners in Christian, contemporary Christian music. So that was pretty much our social setting. So we kind of grew up through that, um, that whole, I mean, that was basically kind of our, our tie to music. I mean, we weren't just interested in that. We were interested in, in as much sinful music as we could possibly digest too. So, but, but the first manifestation, well, we were in a band called Whiteheart. It was a Christian music band. You know, we were probably 19. Dave was probably 18 or 17. Did that, and that lasted a couple of years, and it was great, great friendships, but it, it was, I'll speak for myself, it, um, the way I played guitar, I think, I think from a cultural standpoint within that community, which there were a lot of good friends that came from that, Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, and, and people like that who are you know, friends to this day. And th this was not their judgment, but the collective judgment was the way I played guitar, what I liked was, was uh, like, you know, from Satan himself or whatever. So, <laughs> so and I, true, I, I, you know, I liked wild guitar. So I'm, we moved to Los Angeles, my wife and I did. And I was a studio guitar player. And, it, and the next manifestation of a band came probably about late 20s and I just bored them. And uh, we did them with music and, and got signed to a record deal. My brother moved out and then we were all of a sudden in a rock band. And we were on MTV actually when they played music videos, you know. And that was it. So we started that band and uh, just, you know, it's like something to do. It took about three years for it to finally fail and tank because music changed in the 90s and we were at the end of the 80s. We had the long hair. We were actually a pretty good band. It's some good music. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I'm not embarrassed. Lyrically, it was pretty light, but musically, it was pretty intense. Yeah. And, uh, but it really prepared me for, for what I was going to do 10, 15 years later, which was produce records because you get into the, the mindset of, of how vulnerable it feels to be a recording artist, an entertainer. You live week to week, you live by chart position, you know, do people like me? And that'll, that'll extract some serious uh, emotions. It, it wow. from, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's, it's because it's, I mean, you live it day to day. It's like, you know, when, you know, I mean, not you, but the whole community too. It's like, yeah. when are people gonna get tired of me? And that plays into right so and it's, it's as much as a mental and emotional game as it is yeah. you know creatively figuring out what what you want to record musically what made you move from being a session player to get involved in production it, it was it was it just kind of happened naturally some uh, uh, the guy who i really i i mean there's so many people that i'm i'm that have helped mold build a career for me uh, but at this one particular time there's a really famous producer named mutt lang who I was working for as a guitar player on Shania Twain's records and, and uh, some other pop records. And, and he was the one, the first one that really said, I think you have a producer's kind of headset heart. That's what you should do. And he helped me get my, one of my first real big gigs too. You know, what recommendation from Mutt Lang is, is, is quite serious. And that's what started it. And, and it just, it's, I've always used the metaphor of a kind of a, you know, like building houses, you know, what I did as a guitar player, I was a general contractor. I was hired to come in and, you know, you know, pick, you know, do the plumbing for a house or the electrical, right? Yeah. And one specific job and I was hired by all the general contractors and I became really proficient at that. All of a sudden, it's like somebody said, here, you, you know enough about building houses or you know enough about people. Why don't you take the reins? And that was kind of the beginning of it. And it just seemed a natural manifestation of being a guitar player. And I, I'd learned how to work with so many different people because of all the years playing, first of all, in Los Angeles and then playing in Nashville, country music, you know. Now, specifically going back to playing guitar in Los Angeles, you have been a part of some of the most epic records in history with some of the craziest superstars on the planet. I mean, were some of these artists in the studio when you play um, guitar in their records? Or is there a session that you remember the most? I mean, we're talking about Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston and Barbra Streisand and Madonna. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Are, are there sessions during that time that stick out in your mind? Well, I mean, certainly each one of those that you listed would, would I mean, yeah, I mean, I was young enough to where I wasn't fearful or nervous. I think had I known, I just watched a Quincy Jones documentary the other day, which I'd recommend for any musician, just a, the, the, the 
depth of his work, I didn't even realize, you know, when he started, I just, at that point it was Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson's producer, but mm -hmm. I think I would have been shaking in my boots more had I known what he had done musically. But um, we'll take that session. The first time I got called for a Michael Jackson record. Yeah, he, I walked into Westlake studio and he was uh, in, 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 I saw this guy that looked, I mean, this is, he was really ratty looking guy, politically, the way to say this. I, there's really no other way to say it than just be honest. It looked like a kind of a, it looked like a, a he looked like a person that, that was way down on his luck, mm -hmm. not taking care of homeless, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I, and there's somebody, and I didn't know that was Michael Jackson. It was Michael Jackson. And I just walked up and asked him, I said, you know, why are you dressed like that? I figure I was 24. So 24, yeah. 25. And yeah. he said, that's the only way I can walk around the streets, you know? And I thought, oh, you know, you know, little things like that. Musically it was cool. I mean, you know, you just, you're sitting there and that's what I had aimed for. So I kind of felt like I was where I was supposed to be. Sometimes it, I, my head would swirl a little bit being around some of these people. Madonna was a, she was a force of nature. Wow. She was tough. I have heard so many stories and yet, I mean, some of the, the tough ones are the most creative and most brilliant and you, you see the careers they've had. Well, a little bit from every one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I cannot thank you enough for taking a few minutes out of your day to, um, talk to me. I respect you so much. I love you and your family. And, um, you know, I, I've talked about it a lot and said, I put your name on a vision board of mine the minute I moved to Nashville 10 years ago. And I was like, one day I'm going to work with Dan Huff. One day I'm going to make it happen. And Dan, I'm just so grateful that we got to work on this album together. And I look forward to the music that we get to make together in the future. Um, you're one of a kind, and um, I think we made a, a really special album, and I cannot wait for everybody watching to hear it, but, um, but I just want to thank you. Well, that's so kind, Lindsay, and I, I appreciate that. It does make me uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> I know, as I'm like going on and on, but I need to say it, because that's how I feel. Well, can I leave, can I leave your, your show just with, can I just make one pitch about you? Yeah. Just to, to all the people that are your fans. And, and, and I was a witness on this, so folks, I, I would say to to everybody who who, who uh, is going to check out this 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 work. I mean, pay attention. The the lyrics, everything was was tediously gone through from the from the inception of you writing these songs about your experience, right? And then uh, I will say that I mean, you are one of the hardest workers I've ever been around. To see you sing these songs again and again and again, just to say exactly what what you meant to say and how you know all the nuance and then you know then the guitar playing the same thing and, and check out some of these guitar solos there's some really serious stuff going on here so anyway and the same thing to you Lindsay. i i'm i'm, I'm honored to 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 uh be on the show and i'm honored that you you had me do a record for you in the studio well the first of hopefully many dan thank you so much i can't wait to come over and see you and sherry hopefully soon when we're all allowed to again yes you have the invitation. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. All righty. Bye-bye. I'm so happy we could have Dan on the show this week, especially since we just announced Heart Theory, the album. I love that man so much. All right, guys, for our second guest tonight, she originally is from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. She moved down to Nashville when she got offered a record deal from Lyric Street and since then has become a real estate mogul, designer, and TV personality. You may know her from her show, Masters of Flip, on the W Network or HGTV, as well as Wilson's Music City Fix on HGTV, and as well as making it home on HGTV. She's just all over the place, guys. She's incredible. Welcome, Courtney Wilson. How's it going? I am doing great. How are you doing? I am doing so good. It's so good to see you virtually. I mean, it's been forever since we've talked, but but I feel so close to you right now. This is the new wine and dine. This is the new girl hang. This is meeting. totally the new girl hang. We're pretty much having a girls' night right now. <laughs> Over coffee, that is. <laughs> I know. Amen. Amen to that. Um, so you were originally Canadian. You were a fellow Canuck like me. I know. I'm still Canadian. I'm, I will always be Canadian. Uh, like I'm, a dual, I'm a dual citizen. Are you a dual citizen too? No, I just have a green card, but I'm working on it. 
Okay, yeah. So I'm I'm a dual citizen. Have been for years. Actually, it was right after Lennox was born. She's eleven now. But I was finally like, uh, oh, let's just do it. So we can go in as Canadian, we can come back as American, and nobody bothers us with questions about the kids. Absolutely. So how long have you guys been in Nashville? Uh, well, I've been here for 22 years. And wow. I moved here when I was 18 to get a record deal. I mean, like awesome. we all did. We all came to the capital of country music. And uh, that's when I signed with, with Lyric Street, which is Disney. But it happened really fast. So because it happened so fast, I was able to get a visa and a publishing deal and all that stuff to keep me here. Absolutely. I mean, well, everything, life has its way of working out sometimes. And yeah, it does. Sometimes you just have to take a leap, leap of faith. And looking back now, especially, especially since I now have a child, sorry guys, you can't see her, but her name's Bubbles and she's sitting on, <laughs> on, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Bobbing around. It's her. I'm but, um, so sometimes you have to take a leap of faith and it's crazy to me now because my oldest child, Jet, is 16, and I was only two years older than he was when I fled Canada to go, you know, pursue my dream of country music. And now as a mom, I'm like, oh my God, no. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine? No, I can't. In two years? No, no. We won't. We don't speak of such things. <laughs> yeah, we will not mention that further. Okay, well, you have since become a real estate professional designer, TV presenter. You're just taking over the world. Um, I want to know, how many houses in Nashville have you redone? Like, do you keep, like, a running total? I don't keep an actual. I could try to figure it out. It's somewhere around 150. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. I know. But we've been doing this a long time, and... You know, some years, like in the very beginning, Dave and I were flipping one a year. Like we would take, that was all we had, the equity we had to flip, um, you know, and that was all the risk we were really willing to take. And quite honestly, it was really the thing that we did to support our music habit. <laughs> is that what, um, you know, is that yeah. what you flipping houses in the beginning? Yeah, well, we'd flip a house and do a demo tape, you know, flip a house, go record, you know, like five sides in the studio. So like, that's what we were doing. It wasn't, we didn't want to be house flippers. That wasn't the goal ever, but things evolve. And, um, you know, as we had kids and we decided that, you know, we didn't want to be on the road and we, our dreams just, our dreams evolved. Yeah. Um, we had a show called meet the Wilsons on CMT and that's when we started flipping more. Um, we were still doing music, but it sort of kind of flip flopped. Yeah, you know, where we were having to buy our kids shoes and food. <laughs> Turns Still out, for bills. I was doing that for me. So. I, know. I know. Well, that's so crazy. Okay. Well, I I love everything you do. I think you're so talented in so many ways. But I need to know how do you know what to add to the finishing touches of a room? Like, how do you look at like a bookshelf and be like, okay, a cool face could sit there or a yeah. piece of art is better in this space on that wall like how do you how do you That's have a hard that question out? how it's kind of like saying how do you know how to move on the stage hmm. how do you know you know when to transition um or when to like change your inflections or when to pull the mic away it's a little bit instinctual so some of it is learned like through practice right but some of it is just instinctual where you go wait like that needs to be that space needs to be filled and wait the balance is off i'm not really quite sure let's throw something else there and then the more that you do it the more that it just becomes like second nature um, also, I don't, not for nothing, there are a lot of HGTV shows out there that I feel like so many people now understand what balance is and color and negative space. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it sound easy because it's not, but I think a lot of us have a better handle on it now. I mean, it's easy for you. If you would say how I would put together a room, you'd be like, Let me, <laughs> let me help you because this isn't right. I will. <laughs> okay, that is done, girl. I will hold you to that. Um, how often do you make changes to your own house then? You, you do so many miracles to all of these other houses. So you I've gone through stages. When we started filming Masters of Flip, we honestly would wait until the end of the season, and then I would take on a project. And, and honestly, 
it was way harder taking on my own project than anybody else's project because yeah. you have to live through it. So all those people out there saying, how do you do it? It's hard. Like, you know, this, the house flipping is different than doing your own renovation project. But very currently, I'm going through a, a lot of change in my life. And right before we started quarantining, like two weeks or a week before quarantining, I actually started to renovate my house. <laughs> the timing was very bad. And as, as we all know, it sort of just hit us like a ton of bricks. We should have had warnings, but we really didn't have warnings that it was going to just abruptly stop the world. And so I had my, I had moved into one of our Airbnbs with Dave and the kids and my floors were torn up. My kitchen was gutted. Mm. And so I'm in the middle of a renovation. But what happened during that is that, you know, cause I have this downtime cause I'm not filming is that okay. I want to get all of this stuff done, but I also didn't feel safe having too many crews in the house or crews at all. So I started like tiling the bathroom by myself. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yes. I started taking on these things that I haven't taken on in years, like tiling and painting and, you know, whatever, caulking all the bathrooms. And I was like, oh my God, I was, I was Googling things and I'm a house flipper. <laughs> uh, there's nothing that stops you. You're incredible. Well, uh, next time that. I need anything done, you are going to be my first call. A weekend project. I <laughs> love it. The cool thing with me is that I love, I get my kicks out of like finishing the project. So I'm not one of those like, oh, I've got a bunch of like half done projects. If we're going to start it on a Friday, we're going to be done by Sunday, girl. So <laughs> you're girl. That. I am such a to-do list person as well. I just love to like get check it off. done and check it off. And then I write I'm stuff great. down after I've done it just to check it off. I totally did the same thing. I was like, oh, I did this today and I didn't even write this on my to-do list, but I'm going to because I feel more accomplished. <laughs> It's really good for like being actually in all seriousness. I think it's very good for you to do that because sometimes you get to the end of the, the day and you have this to-do list. Nothing's been checked off. And you're like, wait, I've worked my, my butt off. What did I do? And so I actually think it's important. It's a mental game to actually write things down and check it off and write it down after you've done it. If in the case that, you know, your day is gone awry. Absolutely. Okay. All right. All right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't ask me. I make up my own words all the time. <laughs> I make up my own saying. And my friends are like, uh, oh, Lindsay, that's not a saying. And I'm like, That's my word. That's my point, right? That's <laughs> so in that nature, do you have more than one house going at a time? Or do you always just focus on one house and then one house and one house? No, so well when we're filming when we were filming Masters of Flip, we would have we would do 10 to 14 houses in a season. So, and I always joke, I'm like, you know, we don't really actually flip a house in one hour. So <laughs> we have to have all of them overlapping. So wow. we usually try to have half of them. We start half of them within a month. And then at, at one point in the very middle, we have all of them going on, usually when we're revealing or doing the staging. And then by the end of the season, we only have the other half. Um, this new show, Making It Home, uh, it kind of works the same way, except that I don't have to manage the entire project. Like there's, we have different contractors on different houses to help everything flow a little bit better to, to ease, you know, ease things on Dave and I. Um, but currently right now, um, I just bought a house on Friday and then I bought a house two weeks ago. And the one two weeks ago, I was going to tear down and then I, I bought it without seeing it. And then I went in it and then I was like, wait, maybe I could do make this a really cute little two bedroom rental. So I'm actually going to cover it on social media and I'm going to keep the house, the house that I never walked into. I owned for like, I said two weeks ago, I, I bought it right at the beginning of quarantine. So it's more like two months, never walked inside because I was buying it for the lot. And now I'm going to keep that little brick house. We'll follow that on social media, not on the show. And then I'm, I took on a really, really big house on Friday that I'm going to start this week. Oh my goodness. Courtney. You'll have to come by. I will totally come by. I yeah. have quarantined by myself in a house. <laughs> totally come by. Um, well, y'all need to watch out for what Courtney's doing with all of these projects on the go. And as far as making it home, what can we expect in the future? Well, you know, we, we finished season one. It's already aired in a few countries. We have announcements on other countries coming up. Um, and we're just sort of taking a hot minute right now during this weird time in the world, um, to focus on our family and 
and everybody's focused on, you know, staying safe and healthy, but I think we're going to be making an announcement really soon. So, so stay tuned, but I, I, how are you doing? How are you holding up during quarantine? Girl, I've been good. It's just been, like you said, it's just such a weird time and it makes you feel all these crazy feelings. I mean, I have days where I'm like super, everything's happy and I'm productive and I feel all cylinders are firing. And then I have days that I'm sitting ice cream on my kitchen floor. And well, after you eat the ice cream, why don't you start like a workout channel? Because your body's amazing and I could use some of those exercises. You're sweet. Well, hey, if you help me figure out what negative space means in my living room, <laughs> then I'll come over and we can do a workout together. <laughs> Deal. Okay. Courtney, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your day and away from your family to hang out with us. Um, everybody make sure to keep up with Courtney on social media on all the projects she has going on as well as keep up her announcement on making it home. Thank you, Courtney, so much. Bye, girl. Bye. All right, y'all. Now it is time for everybody's favorite part of their Tuesday, the Wellisms of the Week. All right, your first Wellism of the Week. A lot of restaurants that have had windows smashed and storefronts vandalized from various protests are also committed to supporting demonstrations with handing out food, supplies, and donations. A few blocks from where George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, the owners of Pimento Jamaican Kitchen packed go bags for marchers that included critical supplies to protect people from coronavirus as well as any violence and some first aid items. The manager, Scott McDonald, said, if people are going to be out, people have the right to demonstrate. If that's what you're going to do and you're going to exercise that right, we want to help them do it as safely as possible. That is amazing, Scott. My goodness, your restaurant's going above and beyond. Even after all of the crazy riots and everything going on here, still restaurants and storefronts who are doing what they can to be a part of the community. I love it. I love it so much. All right, Wellism number two. Barcelona's El Liceu Opera House reopened last week with a concert to an audience of over 2,200 potted plants. The event took place a day after Spain's three-month state of emergency came to an end. It was with the help of a Spanish conceptual artist who said that the inspiration came to him from a connection he built with nature during the pandemic. Watch this. All right, Wellism number three. Saul and Keon have never missed a day of work picking up trash in Miami Beach. This past week, when they turned onto a street in the North Bay Road community, they were surprised by a huge group of surrounding residents who'd all gotten up early to line the streets with signs and balloons, all to simply say thank you and that we love you. Even the Miami Beach mayor showed up to salute them. Saul and Keon do so much more than just pick up trash. They bring an incredible positive energy to the entire neighborhood. They simply spread joy. Watch this little clip, it's so sweet. Cheers welcome this friendly duo, and clearly they can't believe it. Every time we see you, you boost our mood. There are people here today that, that you, you don't even collect their trash and they're here because you affect them. Their managers, supervisors, and even the mayor of Miami Beach also among the crowd of supporters. All right, you guys, those are the Wellisms of the week. I'm so excited that we have officially been able to announce the album. It's called Heart Theory. It is out August 14th. Please pre-order it if you haven't already. All the links are below, as well as we have some brand new merch up at the merch store, which I'm really stoked about. So go check all of those out after Living Well, and um, I'll play you a little bit of our brand new song. This is Want Me Back. Try again, try again. 
next week with another really special episode but I'm so happy we could have Dan and Courtney on this week we'll see you guys next week